The text today is from Isaiah 65, 17 through 25. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered or will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lasts but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought to be a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them, and they will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be blessed, people blessed by the Lord, they will, and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, says the Lord. So, <clears throat> how many of you in here are fans of puzzles? Anyone like doing puzzles? Got one hand there, like, you know, the jigsaw puzzles, you know, right? You like, to, you like doing these? Lisa knows what's coming because I've done this before in another sermon. So, yeah? Yes? One? Yeah? Yeah? Some people? All right. What is it you like doing about puzzles? Why are they, why are they so fun? I like puzzles, you know, in theory. I don't do them very often, but uh, they're, they're cool. They're all right. And I brought a couple here. You know, these are a couple of uh, thousand-piece puzzles, you know, and they're kind of challenging, right? I mean, already, just because they're thousand-piecers. And then, uh, but also, these are mosaic, photo mosaic ones, you know? So they're, uh, each individual piece is a different photo, you know? And the book, huh? It's six photos? Oh, it's six photos on each piece. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you can tell these aren't mine, of course, but <laughs> they, uh, they're difficult. They're challenging. Now, when you put together a puzzle, what is essential that you have? Oh, well, of course, yes, all the pieces. That's, al that's always nice, right? But even uh, you don't really know until the end that you have all the pieces, right? So there's something from the very beginning that's very helpful for you to have a resource. You can rely a picture on the, yeah, on the box, right? And of course. Now, Lisa, she likes doing these puzzles, right? A lot. Yeah, there's a fold-out picture inside, too, that you can fold out. But yes, right? You, having a photo to follow of the completed puzzle is very helpful. It's often on the lid of the box. Now, when I'm feeling a little, you know, a little, uh, a little prankster-ish a little bit, one thing that I like to do is this. Have you ever had this happen before? Like, uh, maybe, hopefully no one does this in the store, but maybe you like to take the Do you ever like, have you ever had that happen before you? Happened before to you? Yeah, well, it has happened to you before. Okay, so now what's the funniest thing about this is you can tell I already did this because now the right lid is on the right box. But let's pretend they weren't already that way. But yeah, so you ever been going along, putting the puzzles together, and you're holding up a piece, and you look at the box, and you're like, well, okay, well, I'll set that aside. It doesn't seem to... And you go along for several pieces before you realize, wait a minute, the pieces are not matching 
the box, the lid. And uh, what you end up having to do then is, if you, especially if you don't, can't find the other box that maybe somebody switched with you, what, you, what do you have to do? <laughs> you have to kind of, what do, you, do you continue to just follow the lid on the box? Or what do you do? You just kind of, you hope, you, you stay faithful to the pieces, don't you? You're like, okay, obviously the lid is not matching up. I'm going to have to just work with the pieces I have and see, see what happens. Now, I have to tell you, I've been in uh, ministry myself. Uh, well, it'll be almost, you know, paid ministry, <clears throat> almost, almost 15, 16, almost 17 years. And of, of course, I grew up in church before that. I've been reading the Bible since I was probably, you know, five, four or five. Been reading different uh, versions of the Bible since I was four or five. And I don't know about you or anyone else, but I have found myself frustrated from time to time during these many years of reading the Bible and being involved in church because I suspect that I was given the wrong lid. You ever, ever have that feeling before? I like the pieces. But when I try to figure out how they go together, I think I've been looking at the wrong lid. One of the things that I hope that I can accomplish as a minister, as a pastor, is I want to help people examine their lids on the Bible puzzle box that they've been given. And if I can't help people find the right lid, I at least don't want to hand them the wrong lid. There are a lot of things I think the church has gotten right but there's a lot of things I think in human history we've gotten backwards. Whoever, for example, came up with the bright idea that the way to motivate people to do better in life was to tell them just how rotten they are, I think that's the wrong lid. I think uh, that, I mean, does that, did that ever work for you as a kid? I know it doesn't work for my kids. If I motivate them by trying to tell them how rotten they are first, it just doesn't seem to work. Now, before you turn me in, I don't do, I've not really uh, tried that, but uh, it doesn't really work usually. And where it is, is it written that the way to convince people to have faith in God is to threaten them with horrible torture for all eternity? And why in the world did they depict God as one who essentially hates most of the people who have ever lived? Well, I think this also appears, uh, applies to popular notions about the end of the world, you know? Where did people ever come up with the idea that God is planning on destroying everything and massacring nearly everybody? And yet, if you listen to what a lot of times the church has said about the end of the world, it would seem that is precisely the lid of the box that they're working from. So here's the ultimate contradiction that I found, at least growing up, that those who claim to be people of faith turn out to be the ultimate pessimists. That is when they're talking about the destiny of everyone else. And yet amid all of this fear-mongering, what I would consider to be the heart of of the Bible's message continues to hold out a beautiful and exciting hope. And I find that very perspective in our reading today in Isaiah. One of the first things that stands out to me is that uh, the very realistic nature of the destiny that the prophets saw is this ultimate outcome that God has in store. And he says it this way, no more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime, or, and they shall build houses and inhabit them, they shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit, and they shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. It's a vision of people thriving, of God's children thriving, and of people living full and fulfilling lives. It's a vision of houses built and vineyards planted. It's a vision that includes even natural enemies in the animal kingdom even, living together in harmony. Rather than uh, this passage of scripture moaning about gloom and doom, Isaiah basically breaks into song. This is actually a poem. Most of Isaiah is written as a poem over the destiny that God has in store for the world and those who inhabit it. And this beautiful vision, vision is based on the magnificent deeds, Isaiah says, that God has done and will continue to do. 
It began with the covenant that consisted of a promise to Israel's ancestors and, and leaders that God would give them a gift of peace that would enable them to thrive. But over the centuries, the covenant was broken. I mean, we, we do that sometimes. We break covenants and peace gets marred by corruption and injustice. That happens. And so in Israel's history, Jerusalem gets overtaken and her people uh, are brought into exile. But it's here, in this middle of this, that Isaiah articulates this vision, that Jerusalem will be restored. The implication is that God will fulfill all the promises, if not immediately, then eventually. And Isaiah's vision continues with this language of liberation in a context where really, we, the, we look back and we read this stuff now and it's like old hat and we, it's not quite as radical uh, to us because it's been around, the book of Isaiah has been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and it's been reread and reread and reinterpreted over and over. But in its original context, this is a radical vision where the reality of life, this context of the, the world around when this book was written, is that people constantly, conquerors, continually displace people and take them out. They take their children away from them. They throw them out of their homes and off their lands. And it's in this context that Isaiah envisions a new reality, a new exodus for them. Just as God liberated the children of Israel from slavery and oppression in Egypt, in Isaiah's vision, the people will be brought back from exile to live in their own land, free from the fear of conquest. But here's the thing. Isaiah's vision doesn't just concern Israel and her people. In a very real sense, what Isaiah is talking about in this restoration of Jerusalem, it leads to the restoration of the whole world. And the liberation of, uh, of Israel from captivity leads to the liberation of the whole world. Not only do all the nations receive the good news of God's magnificent deeds, but this destiny God has in store includes all people, even those Israel might have labeled enemies. And we see this unfold in Scripture where it says, from every tongue, every tribe, every nation, will come streaming into God's kingdom. Is Isaiah's vision even extends to, the, to creation. Even the animal kingdom is to be transformed when God fulfills the promises and liberates the people. Indeed, Isaiah puts all of this under the heading of a new heaven and new earth, a whole new creation that is very good, just as the original creation was at the beginning. Now, what a vision this is. That is stark contradiction to the puzzle box lid that a lot of people have. People who delight in painting God as some kind of uh, long-term torturer. But the Bible insists that what God will do at the end of all things will be consistent with who God has always been and what God has always done, which is, from the beginning, create a world full of beauty. To assure people who are wayward again and again that my love, God's love, will never change. To set people free from everything that holds them back. It's a vision of God working to restore all things to the original harmony of creation. That's the puzzle box lid that I see. The God of creation, the God of exodus, the God of the covenant promises brings all things and all peoples into beautiful peace and joyous freedom that makes for a full and fulfilled life. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think God looks anything like the God some people talk about. The God of this vision is the God who is our salvation, Isaiah tells us. Or as one children's Bible version puts it that I re I've read in my many years of Bible reading, the God who is here to help. So how do we go about making this public? The title is, What Disciples Do, Disciples Take Their Faith Public. How do we go about making this public? Okay, fine, Cody, okay. You have me convinced that God cares about rebuilding and renewing and restoring the earth and that um, we have a different puzzle box lid, lid. So what does that have to do with how I live my life today? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
Because in this passage, Isaiah says specifically, no more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days. So in God's reality, infant mortality does not exist. Therefore, issues like health insurance and prenatal care are issues that people who follow God ought to be concerned about and do something about. Isaiah says, no more shall there be an old person who does not live out a lifetime. So in God's reality, senior adults live long, productive, and healthy lives. Therefore, issues like Medicare and Social Security are issues we should care about. Isaiah adds, they will build houses and inhabit them. In God's reality, every person lives in a decent house. Therefore, issues like fair mortgage rates, and practices and affordable houses are issues disciples should do something about. Isaiah goes on, they shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. In God's reality, food is plentiful. Therefore, healthy, accessible, and affordable food are issues we ought to pay attention to and do something about. But Isaiah isn't done. People shall long enjoy the works of their hands. They shall not labor in vain. So in God's reality, people get fairly compensated for their work. Therefore, issues like minimum wage and employee benefits are issues we ought to do something about. People will not bear children for calamity, Isaiah further says. That means that in God's reality, children thrive. So, Issues like child nutrition and early education are issues disciples really ought to care about and do something for. And Isaiah talks about a day when the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, they shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, which I take to mean that in God's reality, violence and warfare don't even exist. Therefore, followers of God work on helping bring peace between people and nations as a major concern and undertaking. Because these issues matter to God, they should also matter to the people of God. God invites us all to be a part of that because the pieces in the box tell me that it's the very people that God rescues who are the people who get to participate in the renewing and rebuilding and the restoring. The lid a lot of us were given says that God cares about souls, but not about bodies. God cares about you going to church, but doesn't care how you interact with the oppressed. That God cares only about personal sins like swearing and lying and cheating and the wrong kind of sex, but then it's as if God has nothing to say about unjust governments and bad laws and evil systems and systemic problems like racism. Brothers and sisters, if that's the way it seems to you, then somebody switched your lid. This passage can help us get the right lid back. God has an invitation to us. Jesus invites us to join in the renewing and the rebuilding and the restoring. Individual Christians, local churches, denominations, and the entire worldwide church must constantly seek ways to advance God's dream as found in Isaiah 65, both locally and around the world. This is how we take our faith public. It's not forcing our values on other people, but it is letting your personal values inform how you interact with other people and work for the good of all people, regardless of their personal faith. And I want to close with a a quote from a commentary that I read this week. The commentary is Feasting on the Word, uh, specifically about this passage. And the uh, author of this particular portion of the commentary is named Mary Eleanor Johns. And she says this, We are able to give one drink of cold water at a time. We are able to bring comfort to the poor and the wretched, one act of mercy or change at a time. One book given, one friendship claimed, one can of beans, one moment of commendation, 
one confession of God's presence, but for the asking. One moment in which another person is humanized rather than objectified. One challenge to the order that maintains injustice. One declaration of the evil that is hiding in plain sight. One declaration that every person is a child of God. These one acts accumulate within God's grace. Amen? Let's pray. <clears throat> God, we come before you as people who, <clears throat> we, we're not perfect. We, uh, we, we're of this, this world in so many ways, good and bad, that we sometimes allow our, our pride or our, our own selfishness to get in the way of what you've given to us to do. But God, we also have opportunities every single moment, one moment at a time, to do something, to help make Isaiah 65 a reality, to be a part of your kingdom. I pray that we would have the strength and the resolve, God, when we have those moments placed in front of us, to act with mercy and compassion and kindness, to make our faith public. God, we love you, and we thank you for every opportunity we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.